than this. <laughs> okay, um, welcome back. Uh, let's see here, it's Thursday, so just this one time, your next homework is due tomorrow, yeah? Your current homework. Um, how many of us have started? Fabulous! I'm not gonna ask any more than that because I, I don't want to be sad. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, yeah, no, there were, my office hours were totally overloaded yesterday, which is great. And you guys are always encouraged to come by and, and uh, work through this stuff and to not wear your headphones during class. Okay, so, uh, right, today uh, we're going to continue uh, talking about modeling scenes. Um, before we get started, any uh, uh, questions about procedural stuff, your homework? Uh, the next one should be coming out, I guess, today or tomorrow. Oh, it's posted already, even better. Excellent. So now, from now on, we're just on the every two week schedule. There's a quiz and a final project. Oh, one thing that I think I forgot to actually announce in this class. The final project is extremely open-ended, right? You guys can already read the instructions. They're on the uh, uh, learning module. That's what it is. Um, if you uh, want, you should get started. All the deadlines are already there. Uh, one thing to know is that the top uh, project is totally subjectively judged by your TAs and myself. Uh, we award a, a free trip to the SIGGRAPH conference, which is the big uh, conference in the computer graphics uh, community. Right? So that'll be, unfortunately, in the coming cycles in Washington, D.C., which is like maybe not the most glamorous uh, destination for a conference. But it's a fun conference if you never attended, a very cool way to uh, get up to date with computer graphics, technology, research, all that good stuff. So that'll, that'll, I'll cover that cost myself. Um, Yep, any, uh, any questions before we get started for the day? Homework, project, exam. Fabulous. And you know, we have a nano quiz every other one. Um, I got an email that the nano quiz was a little hard to read last time. That's fine, and, and if, if you, you truly can't read it, um, I'll, I'll find a way to accommodate. You know, if you email me, we can print it out or something and give you a copy. However, the person who emailed me also happened to be sitting in the back if that's the problem, just sit in the front, guys. There's like a whole set of open empty seats here, okay? Yeah, I saw a hand here. Um, so each homework assignments are going to be due Wednesday. Yes. Yep, exactly. So all the homework assignments will be due every other Wednesday, starting from two days ago. Yep. Any other uh, questions? Fabulous. Okay. So uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of modeling. Uh, in particular, uh, we're going to talk about hierarchical modeling, which you kind of hinted at last time. And now we can go kind of full full in, right? So uh, as a little bit of recap, last time, remember, we talked about designing matrices for linear and then affine transformations. Uh, and now you guys are now all experts at it because you've implemented it all in your homework. Uh, and now uh, we're going to chain them together to uh, assemble uh, Optimus whatever on the screen here. Okay. So, uh, right, our, our motivation is, is, is not so hard. I find I'm like really entertained. Graphics lectures do this all this time, you know, like, what is our motivation? Well, it's whatever this mess is. But it is true that, like, obviously, there's a lot of moving parts to this scene. And um, one thing to know, just like in any part of computer science, is that, uh, you know, we like to modularize, right? And of course, uh, when we, we model uh, Bumblebee and James Franco or whoever that is, and, and all these different people, <laughs> you, you, you know, we, we want them to all be in their own separate modules and to compose them together, just like, you know, object-oriented programming or anything else. Uh, and, and so really our, our motivation in talking about hierarchical modeling is just a way to compose a scene together out of different pieces that all talk to each other in both a local and a global uh, fashion. Okay, so before this gives me a seizure, let's, uh, let's move on. Right, um, so the basic point here is that triangles, parametric curves, surfaces, these are the basic building blocks for fancy objects, and hierarchical modeling is a way to just combine them all together into one big aggregated scene. I think this stuff really isn't all that surprising. As, as parts of computer graphics literature go, I think this is sort of like, if I sat most of you guys down in front of a computer and asked you to model a scene, you'd probably come up with something pretty similar to what we cover in the last lecture today. Whereas like in other parts of this class, there's some really crazy things that happen. Okay, so our plan for today, we'll go over a little bit of review from last time, vectors, points, coordinates, all that stuff. As you've already seen, your instructor has a bad tendency to get himself confused when I'm doing this, but I will try my hardest not to. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about the really uh, key topic of the day, where you talk about forward and inverse kinematics. If you're in the know, you call inverse kinematics IK, then you can go to the graphics industry. Um, and, and, and in particular, after talking about the kinematic chain and, and sort of how we, we go about modeling a scene, 
Um, we'll then uh, talk about a, a kind of a useful, I'm not sure I call it a data structure, but at least an abstraction, which is uh, something called a scene graph, which is what we very typically use uh, to describe big scenes uh, in a 3D uh, environment. The point being that often, we, we think about this like a tree, right? Like, uh, I, think, I think a tree structure is a pretty obvious one in, in computer graphics, like, you know, my arm is attached to my upper arm, is attached to my body, and so on. Um, but actually, we'll see that a directed acyclic graph is, is perhaps a better way to go. Um, the reason being that, like, if I model one tree and I want 10 copies of that tree in my 3D scene, I probably don't want 10 different <laughs> leaf notes in my, 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 my tree uh, describing all those copies, but rather just one thing holding the geometry that everything points to with different transformations applied to it. Yep, so there's a slight uh, subtlety there. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's get started. So, Right, a little bit of review here. You know, as, last time we talked quite a bit about uh, vectors, a lot of different operations we can apply to them, addition, scalar product, and so on. Um, another big one that we covered last time, uh, you know, there's projection of one vector onto another, there's also projections of vectors onto the coordinates of the screen, and we saw that um, homogeneous coordinates could help us carry that out, right? So essentially by adding one coordinate, so if we have points in 3D in the conventional sense, and then we store them with four numbers, then things that originally are nonlinear, right, like perspective projection, become linear in that coordinate system. Yep. Um, okay, so let's do a little bit of review just for fun. Um, so let's say that I have, uh, and I think actually this is not bad notation. So this, these slides were set up by uh, my colleague Boju to kind of keep around subscripts. And the way to read this is that M takes you, you know, on the right hand side, takes in an input in the two space and outputs something in the one. So this is kind of a nice way to remember things when you're multiplying your matrices and type checking. Um, okay, so let's say that I have uh, A in the two coordinate system. I want to write it in the one coordinate system. How can I do that? Well, it's just using a pretty simple uh, change of coordinates kind of thing here. Um, one thing that seemed to help people a little bit in uh, office hours yesterday is a trick that when I was an undergrad in linear algebra helped me because I'm bad at remembering how matrices work. It's a common affliction. So here's the thing. So let's say that, uh, in particular, let's, let's be specific about it. Right? And of course, we can chain these things together. Um, OK, so let's talk about translation, <laughs> in particular in the plane. So how big is going to be our affine uh, homogeneous matrix for translation in the plane? A lot of different math words come glued together there, doing that on purpose. So if the plane is two-dimensional, how big should be the matrix for translation? You're saying three, but you're making a weird gesture that's throwing me off. But you're right, it's three by three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so here's, a, here's kind of a nice uh, way to, 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 to work this kind of stuff out if we get ourselves confused. So let's say I want to work out the, uh, the translation matrix. So maybe I have a, uh, a point in the two coordinate system, and I want a point in the one coordinate system. Yeah? Uh, and, and so I'm trying to figure out what is the proper matrix M12 here. Well, we could go through all the formulas we went through last, uh, last class. Um, or we can do something a little bit tricky, which is the following. So let's say that I take M12 and I apply it to the vector 1, 0, 0. Oh, oops, this is in the plane, sorry. So just 1, 0, 0. What should I get? This is a translation matrix. And this is a vector. What does translation do to vectors? Somebody speak up. Yeah, okay. nothing. Yeah, it doesn't do a damn thing. Yeah, so it just gives us that back. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, if I take M12 and I multiply by 0, 1, 0, this is still a vector. What should it give me? I'm going to interpret that murmur as uh, 0, 1, 0. Right? It doesn't do anything. This is a vector. OK. And then finally, I multiply by 0, 0, 1. First of all, what is this? How should I interpret these coordinates here? if I'm in the projective plane. So first of all, what does that one tell me? It's a point. What point is it? 
the origin. Good, you can get at this stuff. So let's say I'm, I'm doing my translation matrix. Oh boy. And uh, I, I, so remember that I have a point in the two coordinate system, specifically the origin. What is this coordinates in the one coordinate system? If this displacement is PQ. It's not a trick question. Careful. So this is the coordinates in the, the, the one coordinate system of this origin. We're going up this way. It's actually PQ. Yeah. And whoever yelled out was absolutely right. It's PQ1. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So what did I do? I just worked out three particular matrix vector multiplies. And I did it by just reasoning through. Like, what does M12 do to this this? coordinate. What does it do to this coordinate? What does it do to that coordinate? Yeah? Now, here's going to be my trick. So, M12, obviously, this is equal to M12 times the identity matrix. Yeah? So that's 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Yeah? Not anything too exciting. Um, Remember how matrix vector multiply, matrix matrix multiply works? So if this vector, right, in, in uh, linear algebra class, you probably call it E1, is that right? Yes, this is E2, this is E3. Does that notation sound familiar? Okay, then this is really equal to M12 times E1, that's the first column, M12 times E2, M12. That makes sense. So when I multiply two matrices together, really it's like taking the first matrix and applying it to the first column, the second column, the third column. That's it. If you go back and you just look at what matrix matrix multiply is doing, that's it. Just one column at a time. Well, here's the thing. We just worked out what it does to each of those columns independently, right? And now we can just read off our matrix, right? So this is 1, 0, 0, right? That's what it does to E1. 0, 1, 0, P. Q1. Yeah. So if you can't remember, like if you're screwing up your minus P's and minus Q's and inverses and transposes, my advice is just don't think about matrices. And instead just say like, well, what does my matrix do to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1? Then if you just glue those together in the columns of your matrix, you get the full matrix. Does that make sense? It's just a nice way to kind of remember how to do that. Okay. So anyway, there's our, 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 our matrix. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, let's, uh, let's, let's think about a rotation uh, matrix here. So notice I'm rotating counterclockwise to get from the, one, the basis 1 to basis 2 here. Your instructor is really bad at this kind of thing, but we're going to bear with me and we're going to work it out. Okay. So, now... Uh, so remember that this is something taking things in the two coordinate system and putting it in the one coordinate system. Yeah? So, let's say that I have 1, 0, 0, and I apply m, 1, 2 to it. What should I get? Well, for one thing, I should get a vector, so we know that's a 0. What should I get? So, so what should the x coordinate be? So first of all, when theta is zero, then we, we clearly want to get one zero zero back, right? So, yeah. So you're gonna have cosine theta. What should the y coordinate be? It'd be a little tricky. So take a look at this diagram, right? So if theta is some very small number, the y coordinate should be negative, yeah? It should be minus sine theta. Zero. Similarly, if I apply m one two to zero one zero, I should get sine theta zero. Yeah. I can work that out with some some trigonometry, and then finally, uh, if I apply it to the origin, what happens to the origin in a rotation matrix? Nothing, right? 
So, oh, if I combine these three vectors together, I get a rotation matrix. Right? So I know I saw some questions on, on Fiasco, so I thought it was worth working through. Um, right? So at the end of the day, uh, using the same trick as over here, rotation matrix is cosine theta minus sine theta zero minus sine theta cosine theta zero 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 one. Notice this is basically what you probably already saw in linear algebra class, just with 0, 0, 1 glued on the outside. Which makes sense, because this isn't translating at all. Are there any questions about this strategy? It's just like a nice strategy for like, if you can't remember how to derive a rotation matrix or translation matrix, just think of its action on the different basis vectors instead, and then glue those together as the columns. Yes? Uh, oh, sorry, this is just detritus on the screen. Um, let's see here, the x-coordinate. I always get this backward. Rotation matrices should be anti-symmetric, right? Um, no, yeah, this is correct. Okay, so the... Um, so first of all, let's put theta equals zero, so we kind of know that the sine of the cosine, sh the S-I-G-N of the cosine uh, should be positive, right? So now the only question is, is this guy, right? Um, right, so remember that I'm in the two-coordinate system going into the one-coordinate system, right? So when theta is positive, it points this way. So it's actually a positive sign. Yeah, S-I-N-E. It's easy to get that stuff wrong. Uh, in this case, I actually didn't even bother looking at this diagram. I just remembered that rotation matrices are anti-symmetric. I cheated a little. Yeah, but it's a good question. So in the matrix, shouldn't that be a positive sign thing? And indeed it, oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's what you're asking about. You're right, yeah. Um, this is just me copying wrong. Yeah, sorry, absolutely right. That one was right. <laughs> okay, any other questions or stupid mistakes you're going to today? It's okay, I make a lot. Okay, anyway, you guys get the idea here. So now, uh, if I want to, like, you know, combine rotation and translation, what do we do? We just multiply our matrices together, right? And we just have to be super careful to remember what order, right? And remember that multiplying on the left is how we apply, you know, the next operation each time because we have column vectors. So that's how you should be uh, logicing your way through this stuff. So there's our quick review from last time. I think it's like one of these things that's just like easy to get yourself, like if you're watching TV while you do your homework, you'll get it wrong because it's just like one of those annoying little computations that like is prone to mistakes, but conceptually it's not too bad. Any, any, uh, any questions so far? Fabulous. Okay. So the reality is, of course, that one matrix doesn't suffice in computer graphics pipeline. Um, Bumblebee and, and Optimus, whatever, and his friends are all uh, composed of many parts that are glued together in complicated ways. Uh, and uh, the goal here is to model each one um, in its own coordinate system and then put them all together. This is extremely common. Right? If I want to model a bicycle, uh, maybe I model a chain and then what the chain is attached to and the body of the bicycle and the wheels and all these things composed together into one object. Um, and this is what allows, by the way, like multiple people in computer-aided design to model a shape collaboratively, right? Because if they were all working in the same coordinates, it would be a giant headache. Um, and so, so that's, that's really the main machinery that's going on inside of these computer graphics tools. And really, this is nothing new. If you take a robotics course, you'll see exactly the same math. But of course, rather than applying to the virtual world, you're applying to the physical world, right? And so they're, they're very concerned with kinematics, and in particular, designing different types of joints, right? And they're all kinds of different things, everything from a hinge you know, joint, ball and socket, saddle joints, sliding joints, all kinds of crazy stuff that are roughly defined by the degrees of freedom. And indeed, when you take a computer-aided design model or a computer graphics like a skinned character, typically those characters are accompanied with a bunch of little slider bars that, you know, determine the different poses of the different joints. And those things get composed together. And one thing to notice is that that is an extremely non-linear relationship. Right? So for instance, you know, if you look at the rotation angle of your upper arm and you rotate it, it might be that like your middle finger <laughs> takes kind of a weird, awkward path, 
even though it's a very simple rotation that's going on because you're really composing a lot of other stuff uh, in between those, right? And so it's, it's, it's really amazing the complexity of the motion that you can get out of a few simple controls. Right? I mean, I think uh, double pendulum is a famous example in uh, physics. Right? So in character animation, we often see uh, characters that look like this, 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 this crazy dude here. Um, and, and the joints are all kind of organized in one giant hierarchy, right? So there will be some base uh, for your 3D model. This is sort of the coordinate system of the whole character. And everything, you know, is, is described in terms of that. And so you compose together all the transformations relative to the center thing. Then the center thing is, is, is what you place. Um, and, and each time you have a joint, this thing is defined with a different degree of freedom. Yeah, and so on uh, your homework two, essentially you're going to implement exactly this forward kinematic model. Um, where you're going to compose together all the trans transformations you need to get a, a first like a little stick figure character like this and then we're going to put skin on him. Which sounds creepy. Okay, um, so the kind of typical parameters that go into joints are really not terribly surprising, right? You have things like offset, right? If you're composed with bones, then things are offset from the center point and then some amount of rotation and then now you have the location of this bone and now you want to specify the next one, it's some new offset some new orientation, and so on. Um, and of course, uh, one typical detail that's hiding in a lot of uh, kinematic kind of characters is that many of the joints have limits. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, you, you simply prescribe, like, your elbow doesn't go beyond 45 degrees, or maybe like 48 degrees or 180, whatever. OK. Cool. So th th this is the basic way that we usually define one of these objects. And, and sometimes we call this the kinematic chain. This is the idea that you're chaining together multiple transformations to get to the pose of any individual uh, piece of an object. Okay, so let's see an example. So here's a robot arm. He's got, uh, I think, three segments and three joints, one hinge joint, um, some other degrees of freedom. And uh, notice that there's all kinds of coordinate systems going on in this, this typical thing, right? So you can kind of read these as like, here's the range of motion. So apparently this thing can go from minus 90 to 90. Uh, he does not have a very human, like, well, I guess it's kind of minus 90 to 90. Uh, you know, this one has a different rotation angle, length, and so on. So when I use the term forward kinematics, this is the sort of easy version of the problem, where you're given all of this information. You're given, like, my elbow is at this angle, my wrist is at that angle, my upper arm is at this angle, and now I want to know the transformation angle matrix from the center of my body to my hand. Right, then how do I do that? I just multiply together a bunch of transformation matrices. And that process is called forward kinematics. Right? And, and so if you want to animate a character using forward kinematics, what would you do? You would animate like the angle of the joint as a function of time. And that's not all that atypical, right? Um, is that an easy animation to control? Yes and no. It's easy in the sense it's very easy to prescribe joint angles and get predictable motion. But let's say that I tell Russell, I let, you know, he's got his human body sitting in a chair, and I want to animate him reaching out and uh, you know, giving Darius a high five. And the degrees are from, oh, he left him hanging. Uh, OK, there we go. Yeah, good work. Thank you, thank you gentlemen. So uh, how easy is it to animate that in terms of a forward kinematic model? And who has vote easy? And I'm, I'm a strong believer in very contact-intensive high-fives. There's your hint. Is this an easy, easy high-five to animate? Hard. Can't even right now, I just want to take a nap. A few of you. Yeah, uh, so it's actually quite difficult, right? Because, you know, we're used to thinking about like, oh, I want to reach out and give Darius a high-five. Well, I know where his hand is, I know where my hand is, I'm going to make those two things me. But those aren't actually my degrees of freedom. My degrees of freedom are like, this angle, that angle, this angle, and my constraint is something in like 3D space that's surrounding these two bodies. Right? And so for a lot of animation problems, um, this forward kinematic model is going to be a quite difficult one to work with. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, okay, but thankfully, uh, theoretically, forward kinematics is quite easy to describe. And for a lot of animation tasks, it's good enough, right? Like if you're animating some part and it really doesn't have anything to do with the surrounding universe, you're just gesticulating whatever, um, then maybe forward uh, kinematics is okay. Um, so let's for formalize this a little bit. 
So for each joint in your forward kinematic model, maybe you have some parameter. By the way, this is very common in machine learning. It also happens a lot in graphics. I think in undergrad, you're often used to think of theta as angle. Here, the theta might be angle, but it might also be like translation in your kinematic model. It's just a set of numbers that are describing the different parts of your kinematic chain. Right? And so there's one long vector which describes the whole state of your system, right? Like the angle of your wrist and your elbow and your forehead, whatever. Um, and your job is to compute the position of the end effector in space. Notice that a lot of this language is borrowed from robotics, right? So uh, why do we call it an end effector? It's a pretty literal term. I mean, it's like the end of a kinematic chain and you're <laughs> affecting stuff. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so the forward uh, kinematics problem is just, you know, if I have all these parameters, how do I get the position of all the different objects and, you know, pieces of my, my kinematic chain? That makes sense? The nice thing is this is like deterministic. It's just a formula, right? This is uh, pretty straightforward in principle, right? So, uh, for example, if my goal here is to compute the position of the point P in space, and P is 2 comma 0 relative to this joint, what do I have to do? Well, I have to take this guy's joint relative to this one and put it in his coordinate system and then his coordinate system and compose all those things together, right? So at the end of the day, if I have P local, and I go, you know, M to 3, so from 3 to 2, from 2 to 1, from 1 to 0, and that's the, the world. Do you see how that's going to be a giant headache to code on your homework assignment? Because if you accidentally swap these two things, all kinds of crazy things are going to start happening. And in a minute, we're going to have to compose that with like inverses of matrices just to make your life a little harder. OK. Right, so that's our, our basic setup. And so like in its full glory, maybe you get this whole expression here, right? So like I have a 30 degree rotation followed by a translation of 4, followed by another rotation of 50 degrees, a translation, and so on. Remember, you have to read right to left here. This is the uh, Hebrew part of our lecture. OK, any, uh, any questions about how to kind of derive the, uh, the kinematic chain formula here? And let's make sure that we understand the notation from a few slides ago. Remember, we had this function f of theta. So to be concrete for this example with the arm, the theta would be like 0, 6, minus 45, 5, 0, 50, 4, 0, 30, right? Long vector all the numbers associated to our system, right? And then the function f puts all of those numbers into these assorted functions, multiplies them all together, and gives you your, your point. Okay. Cool. All right, so what are our pros and cons? So the pros here are this is extremely efficient, right? I mean, your, your matrix multiplies here are tiny, right? They're just three by three, which for your computer is like zero CPU time. And, um, you know, it's very easy to kind of express a scene um, and when you're doing, you know, motion in an open space, flying birds, fish, doing fish things, um, you know, then, then this is a pretty straightforward model. But interacting with the environment is really hard, right? Because essentially I'm like using local coordinates, but my environment's in its own coordinates, which has nothing to do with my own. And so composing those all together becomes quite a challenge. So how do you think we're going to solve that? If forward kinematics goes from the angles to world position. Now I want you know, Darius and Russell to have their high five, so I have the position of the high five, and they're trying to figure out how to put their arms in the right place to have the highest maximum you know, ratio of volume to surface area. What problem are they going to solve? It's not forward kinematics. Inverse kinematics, or backward kinematics. I've heard people call it that. OK. Right. So this is the problem of IK. So in IK, we have a slightly different problem, which is, I'm, say, a robot. It's true. And uh, you know, I'm controlled by certain joints, right? Some you know, joint that has maybe one degree of freedom, another one with maybe two degrees of freedom on a good day. And uh, you know, uh, so now I want to pick up this chair. What do I have to do? I want to solve a problem that says, choose the angles of my joints so that my hand ends up here. Right? So in some sense, remember that function f? What am I trying to do to f? I'm trying to invert it, right? Um, so that's, that's the inverse kinematic problem. It's given a desired location orientation or the end effector. That's my hand. Um, what are the required joint angles? Put it there. 
inverse kinematics, forward kinematics is, is sort of a self problem. It's just a bunch of matrix multiplies. Um, inverse kinematics, right? So going from E to theta is a much more challenging problem. In fact, I would argue it's still unsolved and it will continue to be unsolved forever because this is just like not a problem where there's some optimal solution. Yeah? Um, and, and let's see what can go wrong. Um, first of all, I need my coffee today, I'm sorry. Let's say I'm standing in the back of the room and I want my coffee. And the only thing I can do is control my upper arm, my joints. Can I, can I get my coffee? <laughs> no. So is this system of equations always solvable? No. No. Conversely, let's say uh, I have a robot. I attach it to the wall. There's the wall. Right? And he's got two ball joints here. Right? So both of these can rotate arbitrary ways. And uh, my coffee is here. See, there's the Starbucks logo. Okay? How many ways are there? But first of all, is this problem solvable? Yeah, absolutely, right? I can do something like that. Yeah? Is that the only solution? No, I could have, uh, I don't know, done that. <laughs> is that the only solution on 3D? No, there's a whole like 360 degree set of solutions that are, are perfectly fine to this IK problem. So, sometimes the solution to this problem doesn't exist. Other times, the solution is extremely non-unique, right? This is a big problem for computational systems, right? Because you, you know, when you write down IK software, first of all, okay, it's pretty clear intuitively that like I can't reach my coffee from here, yeah? But what if my arm is composed of like a thousand joints and some of them have like weird restrictions on the angles that they can do and my coffee is like just out of reach? It, it, it's not always so easy to even check if an IK problem is solvable. Right? In fact, I uh, think it's NP-hard in general. Sorry. NP-hard in general. But uh, in, in other cases, uh, not only is it solvable, um, it's, it's solvable in, in multiple different ways. Yep. And so, so that's where things really get challenging. Okay. So hopefully I'll convince you that these are, are, are that finding a solution for IK be, can be hard. Sometimes the problem is under constrained, sometimes it's over constrained, sometimes there's no solution, sometimes it's unique. Um, and typically it cannot be solved analytically, meaning that there's no formula. Given the position of my coffee cup, there's no just thing I can plug in that's going to give me the end effector to, to, to put it together, except in very specific scenarios. This is different from forward kinematics where there is a formula. We wrote it down, right? It's just a bunch of matrix multiplies. Um, and so usually when we do IK, we have to result to numerical techniques, meaning that we're just going to try and come up with some iterative procedure to estimate the joint parameters because we can't quite get there exactly. That makes sense? Now in your homework assignment, what I will not ask you to do is implement IK. If you want a challenging, by challenging I mean like hella challenging, um, uh, extra credit, step one is save a backup of your corrected homework. Uh, and then try to implement an IK model. Like, I think we give you like a slick 1990s skateboarder dude, like, you know, with a, a bunch of joint angles. See if you can make a user interface where you can just pose his hand somewhere. I've yet to see a graphic student pull that off. Um, but you could be the first, and I would be very impressed. Okay. So why is IK so, IK so, so difficult? So, Let's think back to our, our, our skeleton example. Remember, we had all these different displacement and angles. So like, here's our giant function, right? These are all the different parameters that go into my forward kinematic model. This is basically hiding inside of this function S is just a giant matrix multiply. But each of these matrices, like for instance, we wrote them down at the beginning of class, like their entries could be nonlinear functions of the kinematic parameters, right? Like there's cosines and sines here, right? And now we want to solve this, uh, this system of equations, yeah? Uh, and there are many different ways to do that. Uh, we're going to briefly introduce one, just so you're kind of aware of what goes on in IK systems. By the way, have you guys ever experienced IK in a video game? You probably noticed it because like, you have a character and you like, try to control it some way and its joints are like, popping every which way. And, yeah, your question or just uh, you do experience? Yeah, yeah these, so they tend to be extremely unstable and, and hard to work with. 
Um, but they are built into a lot of graphics tools. Um, so how do we do that? Well, if we have a, a function, f of theta, remember, so f is the forward kinematic model. It goes from the angles and the displacements to the end effector. Then I can compute a matrix. It's called a Jacobian. How many of us remember this term? Some, kind of, sort of. You're yawning. We haven't even started the math yet. Uh, right, so the, the, the Jacobian is essentially all the possible ways that I can differentiate the function f, right? Like, so the derivative of f and the fifth angle of the y-coordinate of the end effector. Like, every, every possible combination, right? Solving f of theta equals e for theta is quite difficult. What's the very typical thing to do in this scenario? When is the one time that a system of equations is so hard to solve? When it's linear. We know how to solve linear stuff. Right? You all took linear algebra. You can like probably, you know, reduce row reduce matrices with like a blindfold and your hands tied behind your back, right? And uh, which is like a useless skill, by the way. Like seriously, I don't know why they still teach that. Um, but uh, we know how to solve ax equals b given a matrix a and, and a vector b. Yeah. So this system of equations is extremely nonlinear, but what do we know? We know, um, so we have the Jacobian, right? This is every possible derivative of f in every, every possible angle. We know that f of theta is approximately equal to what? Well, let's say that I have some other angle theta zero. In fact, actually, a better way to do this, sorry, doing this off the top of my head because I felt like it. Um, let's say that I have theta and I add a small perturbation. So this guy is small. What's the good approximation of this thing? Well, the simplest approximation, if it's small enough, <laughs> is this roughly equal to f of theta. Not a terribly exciting approximation. Yeah? So what would be the first order thing? Don't all speak at once will be a linear approximation to f centered at theta. Remember, like, Taylor series should be a term that's floating through your head. I know you guys know the answer. You're just shy. What I do is I take the Jacobian at theta, and I multiply it by d theta. That's, that's, right? This is just like f plus f prime times the displacement, yep, plus maybe some term that I don't care about. And in this class, we'll just slice this term out. When we talk about ODE integration, this term is going to be important. Is this ringing a bell? Yeah? No, it's, if, you, if you have questions, you should stop me. This is just saying, so this big O is a sloppy no math notation for saying there are remaining terms here in my Taylor series that I'm not going to have, but they look like d theta squared. Right? So they're second order. Right? And so typically, like, what are we trying to do? Well, maybe we're trying to solve this problem. Right? We have the end effector, we're trying to find theta, or equivalently, like we have some estimate of theta and we like to make it better. So we're going to find d theta that improves it. In the ideal world, I'd like to solve this as an equation I can't. So instead, what I do is I solve e equals f, this is really a squiggly equals, that's supposed to be a squiggle. e is approximately equal to f. So this is a linear system of equations for delta theta, assuming theta is fixed. Yeah, no, it's some acknowledgement. You guys are killing me today. When you're saying a delta theta, you just start d theta, you're just saying like a very, very small. Exactly. Yeah, so what I'm saying is I have some estimate theta of, of the solution to my IK problem, and now I want to make it better, so I'm going to try and improve it by adding some delta theta, right? I'd like to solve this equation for delta theta, right? If I could solve this equal sign, I'd be happy. I would have, my IK problem would be done. But this is nonlinear and crazy. So we're going to linearize f. And now this is solvable for d theta. In particular, what is it? Well, it's, let's see if we can get it right. That's e minus f theta pre-multiplied by um, minus j theta inverse. 
Now, if I take my theta and I add this delta theta to it, am I done with my IK problem? I should stop? No, right? Because I made an approximation here, right? So what do I do? Again, I iterate, yeah? Anybody know what the name of this algorithm is called? You might have seen it in just like a numerical mathis class. Actually, our department doesn't have much of a numerical mathis class, does it? I'd like to teach one in the spring, so if you're interested, you should let the department know so that I can. Um, it's not quite gradient descent, although gradient descent is applicable to this kind of a problem. This is called Newton's method. Right? And New in Newton's method, what you do is you linearize your problem, you solve the linear version, but because you linearized, you weren't quite right, so then you linearize again and, and you iterate. Yeah? So like the picture you should have in mind, let's say I have a one-dimensional IK problem. And so here's theta, right? And I'm trying to solve something, and maybe E is zero just for simplicity. Right? Then what do I do? I take my objective, I linearize it, and I find the root of the linear approximation. But then I go back to my original problem, so I linearize it again, I find the new root, and I iterate. That's what this algorithm is doing. Okay? So this is called uh, Newton's method. Um, that's dangerous. Um, it's very, very simple, but I managed to get it right. J d theta equals d g. Yep, I waited. And, uh, yep, that's, that's uh, one technique for, for solving IK problems. The only problem with Newton's method is, is, is one of these algorithms that I think the only stuff you can prove is like New Newton's method works when Newton's method works. Um, is, is, I mean, we made an approximation here and we're iterating and if this algorithm reached a fixed point, then you solve your linear system, but we didn't show that it should always do that, right? And indeed, there are many scenarios where it doesn't. And so there's all kinds of tricks for improving this, but this is the sort of basic algorithms that, that, that's sitting behind a lot of IK techniques plus a lot of accoutrement to make it more stable. That make sense? Cool. Yes? Well, that's a great question. If you take a robotics class, you'll spend a whole, like several weeks covering different IK techniques, although they might come under different names. Um, Newton's method, people like it because it takes big jumps. Right, like so. If you have a linear problem, the Newton's method will give you the solution in one step. Um, whereas gradient descent, right, you take small steps, but even for a linear problem, you won't solve it. Um, on the other hand, it's unstable, right, and, and so that's the, the typical trade-off. If you wanted to apply gradient descent to this problem, it's a completely reasonable thing to do, and I guess is popular given our current machine learning overlords. Um, what I would do would be to, to look at solving min theta of something like f of theta minus e squared. Right now it's an optimization problem. And now I can do gradient descent on that. And I do think that's a technique people do in practice. By the way, my own research works on some, some multi-objective problems. Where you say, like, I'd like my robot to reach out to this point, but I'd also like it to not fall. And I'd like it to look attractive while it's doing that. And so I actually have like five different Fs that I'm going to satisfy all at the same time. You know, there's some space of trade-offs between these different objects. Um, and so there's some outer loop that you have to deal with um, to kind of understand what the different types of actions that you have available uh, to you are. That's a much harder problem. Okay. Right. So what are the pros and cons here? Well, in IK, the, the, the pros are that if you have an extremely effective IK tool, you're lucky. Like, maybe you're, you just don't have that many joints leading to your end effector, and somehow this Newton's method is working okay for you. That's great, and it can make for much easier modeling, right? Because you're essentially just saying, like, put this here, and it's figuring out how to do it, right? But on the other hand, as we saw, it's much more complicated than just composing together a bunch of uh, matrices, and IK can often fam fail. And moreover, thanks to these non-uniqueness problems, IK, you might have, like, the world's best IK algorithm, but in your computer graphics environment, it's not very helpful. Like, so for instance, Maybe I like want to animate tug of war, right? Like so, there's like two robots here, and you know, here's another one. He's a boring robot. He just has an arm. Yeah. And it could be that like, you know, maybe my animator is like animating some dramatic path for my Starbucks cup going back and forth. Well, and and just being lazy and using IK to pose the arms of the robot. What could go wrong? Well, 
this robot has a lot of different ways that he can reach the end effector, right? So as a function of time, his elbow could be like popping all over the place, but from the perspective of these algorithms, it's perfectly happy, right? So from an animation perspective, you have not succeeded, but from an IK perspective, you have, right? Um, the term to keep in mind for that kind of a problem is something called temporal coherency. <clears throat> Pardon. Temporal coherency. <laughs> in other words, that you want a lot of these problems is not enough to just solve. You want it to be coherent in time. Does that make sense? By the way, temporal coherency shows up all over the place, right? So another good example, uh, when I was working at Pixar, we worked in non-photorealistic rendering. So like, I have a 3D scene and I want to make it look painted. And often animated people want to do this through a whole animated sequence. But what happens if I ask like 100 artists to just paint every frame of an animation? They might all independently look good and then you play them in sequence and it just looks like noise, right? Because paint strokes are kind of, they're not arbitrarily placed, but there's some, some stochasticity to it. Um, so temporal, temporal coherency in that world is, is really critical. Yeah? Yeah, so, so Colton's question is a totally reasonable one, which is, like for this guy, there really aren't that many parameters, right? There's an th angle here and an angle there. And maybe you just enumerate for every you know, increment of one degree, these two guys. Um, and that, that's a, a totally reasonable thing to do. We call that like kind of global optimization strategy. Um, a very typical thing to do would be enumerate a bunch of starting points and then run Newton's method. So that like you're viewing this as just like a local thing to make it better rather than trying to rely on it to get the best solution from an arbitrary starting point. Totally reasonable thing to do. However, if you have like 10 joints, well now you're enumerating points in 10 dimensional space, Kind of host. Yeah. These are all great questions. Any, any other? Fabulous. So anyway, IK is one of these topics that's um, a little bit more of an advanced one. If you're looking for a good course project, there are many hiding in this area. So for instance, here's a very famous paper. Um, Jovan Popovich actually used to be a, a faculty member at MIT um, on mesh IK. So this would be like you have a triangle mesh. This is, in some sense, the most, <laughs> it's kind of a dated paper, it's a Pentium 4. Uh, but in Mesh IK, I mean, you guys have the Stanford Bunny, and in some sense you might want to pose it, but that's a problem because, of course, it's composed of many thousands of vertices, right? So there's like a really complex IK problem hiding there, uh, which is to move all the vertices of the mesh to satisfy some user's constraints. So you guys can see uh, kind of what's going on here. So the way that they get around that in this particular piece of research, because this is a ton of degrees of freedom, right, uh, is that... Um, they use, sort of like if you've ever seen um, principal component analysis in uh, your statistics class, they take like a couple typical poses for a 3D model, like these red things that you're seeing, and then they kind of combine those to get new ones. So the reality is that the IK problem is in just a couple parameters, because it's like combining these simple poses as opposed to placing every single vertex. So these are the kinds of things people do. Cool. All right, so for the remaining part of our class today, we're going to talk about one more uh, thing. We can go back to the forward uh, kinematics uh, chain and talk about hierarchical uh, sort of ways to specify a scene in 3D. Right, so if you've ever found, uh, for instance, there's a very famous file format, it's called Open Scene Graph, which you might have seen before, it's sort of a specifying a 3D scene. These are the sorts of things that are hiding there. And the basic point here is that we can really understand a lot of these skeletons using a graph structure, right, where you have some root, and then you think of the edges in your graph as transformations that take you, like, from the parent to the, each of the leaves. And this is kind of a nice uh, way of, of, of thinking about this. And in fact, what goes on in graphics tools, which is super clever, it was an insight, gosh, about 30, 40 years ago, probably more than that, actually. Um, it's like, let's say that I have a piece of code for drawing a hand. Right? And it's really good at drawing very detailed hands. And now I store some matrix, which is a transformation from hand space to world space. One thing I can do in my rendering algorithm is just every time it's about to send a triangle to the GPU on the hand, it just takes the vertices of the triangle and then behind the scenes multiplies it by some matrix you have around. Then there's a really clever trick, which is that the piece of code you have for drawing hands has no idea your transformation from your hand to your arm to your body to the camera, right? But just by pre-multiplying by those matrices kept around, um, 
implicitly it's doing that during the rendering process, right? You take the vertices of the triangle, and before you draw the triangle, you just multiply this matrix that you're keeping around. Right? And so a very typical algorithm is going to look like traverse down the tree, right? So you're going to keep some matrix in the background, and every time you traverse an edge, you're going to pre-multiply the matrix by that, that new matrix. And then you can call some abstract piece of code here that draws this object in its own coordinate system, but behind the scenes, the graphics card is just multiplying all the vertices by this matrix you're keeping around. Right? So you have this kind of stack of matrices you're pushing and popping as you move around in the graphics uh, uh, world. Really clever trick. Right? Um, so this is like a recursive way to draw a scene. Right? It's depth first. So every time you visit a geometry node, you draw it. And every time you visit a... In different textbooks, think of transformations like nodes and some of the things like edges. It's not a big deal. Um, Every time you see a transformation, you apply it. Okay. And how to handle them, just remember that they're always in the coordinate system of the parent and you're in good shape. Okay. And so, uh, right, so this is uh, known as hierarchical uh, traversal of your scene. So far, it's a tree. Um, and essentially, it's a very simple algorithm, right? So every time you see a transformation node, you apply it. Every time you see um, a node with some geometry on it, you draw it. But before you draw it, you apply whatever your current matrix is to all the vertices in your geometry. And the nice thing is from the perspective of that piece of code that's drawing, it doesn't need to know where that matrix came from. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, see an example. So here's a, I want to draw, I guess, a table with some fruit on it. So here's a, this kind of a scene graph that describes that. So I have a translation to go to the table, then another one to do the table top, and so on. Right. So what does my algorithm do? Well, it initializes some matrix behind the scenes to the identity. Right, because anything that I draw at the root node, I don't have to do anything. Right? And now I'm going to traverse this tree. Right? So if I move down here, now I've added the translation. And now I render the, tree, the, the, you know, the table and some fruit. And maybe before that, I just take all the vertices of the table and I just apply S to it. Yep. Now when I move down the tree, I see another translation. I apply that on one side or the other, depending on whether I think of the translation as going from bottom to top or top to bottom. Um, now I draw the next group and so on. And then when I work my way back up the tree, I have to push stuff off the stack. Okay. And similarly here. Cool. And so on. Right. And so the basic point here is that the transformation that I need when I'm rendering is the transformation from object to world. Notice I multiplied on the right hand side. And that makes sense here. <laughs> right? Because the matrix that I'm keeping track of is this relative to the thing before it. Yeah. This is one of those cases where you got to, every time you see a matrix multiply, you should think right or left, and you got to logic your way through it. Okay. Right. So you update your state during your traversal. You move up and down the tree. How should I implement this in practice? Like, what data structure should I be using? A stack. Yeah. Is a stack necessary? I mean, I could have done another thing, which is I could move down the tree, Every time I go down an edge, I multiply. Every time I move up, I multiply by the inverse. Why is that maybe not a good idea? It's actually two big reasons. That's right. The, the, the inverse of a matrix, might, you might not store it exactly. You're in double precision floating point. Right? So it could be a matrix times this ma inverse. It's not quite the identity. And these scene graphs can be quite large, right? I mean, if you have like a tree with leaves, and the leaves have other leaves, whatever. Like, these are, are big hierarchies, and so there's a lot of opportunity to accumulate error. The other reason to do that is certain transformation matrices, in particular, like camera transformations and certain things that flatten out of shape, might not be invertible. And that's actually okay from the perspective of the forward kinematic model, but if you were to implement this algorithm by multiplying by inverses, you'd get in trouble. Okay. Cool. So instead, uh, as we, we suggest, we'll use a stack. Uh, and that's going to keep a state variable, which is kind of like all the transformations matrices we've seen so far. And every time we want to move up the tree, we just pop the stack and we, we use the old uh, matrix we had before. Now, it used to be that this stack was actually implemented in OpenGL. There was um, a model view stack for the 3D model and another one for the camera. Um, unfortunately, that's actually been removed. This was uh, part of the, uh, the great OpenGL deprecation. Uh, and the reason why is that, like, is this necessary for drawing a scene? No, like, this is just one technique. There are many others. Uh, and so OpenGL removed this feature and said, if you want to stack, then, then make it yourself. And I, I think that was actually the right thing to do, because the stack doesn't have anything to do with your graphics card, right? I, uh, 
This is something that can happen on your, your CPU. Um, okay. So in general, uh, we call uh, this kind of structure a scene graph. Notice I did not call it a scene tree. Why is that? I mentioned this at the beginning of class. Because they have a table with four chairs. How should I model that? So I have, you know, here's table space. If I did it in a tree, what would my, my, my scene graph have to look like? Well, it's quite simple, right? I mean, chair one, chair two, chair three, chair four, right? But does it make sense to keep four triangle meshes of the same chair? No, right? Um, so it's actually perfectly unambiguous to have a chair object and have all these edges point into it. Notice these are directed edges. That's okay as long as my graph doesn't have a cycle, <laughs> right? And so this is something called a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. The point is that if I have an object and it appears more than one time in my scene, I only need to store it one time. And it's okay if it has multiple parent nodes. It just can't have, you know, I can't go in a loop. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. All right. Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, the kind of tree one. More generally, we have a DAG. And that makes sense, especially in, in bushy scenes, scenes with like lots of tables and chairs, lots of characters. That's the more typical thing. If you look at the open scene graph uh, format, that's like how they, they store stuff. Yep, um, it makes a lot of difference. A lot of difference. A lot of sense here. Right. And so, uh, yeah. So remember that we talked about the, the rendering pipeline. This is vertex processing. You get these primitives, and you render it. After you compute the current matrix on the stack, and now you start rendering triangles, where in this pipeline do you think that that matrix is applied? In the vertex processing, right? Because that's the thing that's processing the geometry in your scene. And that makes sense. This is a perfect example of a vertex shader, right? Because just, you have some shader that just takes every single triangle and applies the same matrix, which takes you from local coordinates to scene coordinates. Um, and it's just applied like a giant sledgehammer. doesn't need to know where those triangles came from. Its job in life is just to draw triangles. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right, and so for this, you have everything you need to have these nice, like, kind of hierarchical scenes with all these different elements inside of them. What was that? Yeah, well, this is very typical. So, so scene graph files get complicated fast, and that's for a good reason, right? Because 3D scenes are complicated. In fact, very typical is that it's not just one file, it's a whole directory worth of like 3D models and different objects inside of each other's coordinate systems and so on. I mean, it's total soup, and the annoying thing is if you miss any one of those files, the whole thing is, is, is verschlicked, right? Um, another thing that's worth noting is, of course, inside of this tree, you can store things like material parameters as well. So you're not just restricted to storing objects and transformations, right? Like you might say, everything underneath this node is by default painted green. And that might be a useful state variable to keep around. Anything you can put inside of that stack is the kind of data you would store. Okay, so in your next assignment, to be concrete about it, we're going to give you a very simple class called Matrix Stack, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, and uh, you also, as many of you guys already saw, I hope you saw it in your current assignment, um, there's some kind of convenience functions for making like translations, rotations, and so on. A few of you in my office hours, I noticed, implemented this yourselves. So that's fine. But you might dig around a little in the source and, um, and see that we did it for you. And so you'll uh, implement some of these like push and pop kind of functions. Pushing onto the stack is kind of an interesting operation because typically two things happen, right? One is you add a new thing to your stack. The other is that you multiply it on the right-hand side to whatever your state variable is hiding here, which is the current matrix taking you all the way from local to global coordinates. For instance, what would not make sense is every time a new vertex comes in, so you keep track of all those different matrices and multiply them all one by one by the new piece of geometry, right? You might as well compose all those matrices once and then render a bunch of triangles, right? And so that's what usually happens in the stack here, right? And so every time you encounter a uh, transform node, the nice abstraction here is it's very simple, right? You just push a new matrix onto the stack, then you call all, all its children, and then you pop it, and if you wrote your recursive code just the right way, this is like one of very few times where you actually see recursion. Like I feel like in your intro programming class, they're like obsessed with it. 
then you never actually see it. This is the case where you actually want recursion. Um, and then you, you, you pop when you're, you're, you're done. Yep. Um, yep, and so you'll end up with a bunch of uh, stuff that looks like that. A few things that are worth um, calling out specifically for the assignment that went out yesterday. So remember that in a shader, like this thing on your graphics card, first of all, remember shaders don't just do shading. One of the things they do is apply this geometry thing to all the triangles. Shaders have certain variables called uniforms. And those are things that are shared among all the vertices. What would be a reasonable uniform for the stuff that we're talking about now? It would be the one matrix that takes you from local to global coordinates, right? And so one thing you have to do, you guys are basically in this class until your last assignment are just writing C++ code, you're not writing shaders. So you're going to implement your stack in C++. That's actually the correct thing to do. Your stack is not something that's massively parallel. It's just a 3x3 three three matrix. Um, but then you need to upload that 3x3 three three matrix into your graphics card so that you can use it for shading. And so there's this uh, set uniforms thing that you're going to have to call a bunch of times. In fact, if I were you, I'd call it more times than are necessary just to remember to do it. And this is what's telling your, your computer behind the scenes, like, I'm happy with the matrix on the top of my stack. Please put it on the graphics card. And now any triangle that I render, just by default, multiply by this matrix before you render it. Does that make sense? This is a clever trick. So OpenGL is all about state variables, meaning that, like, yeah, to help us think about our scene, we have all this cool recursive structure. The graphics card doesn't care. It's just a sledgehammer that knows how to draw triangles. And so it says, like, whatever, don't tell me your scene graph. Just give me the one matrix I need to take my triangles to global coordinates, and then I'll just sit there and hammer on all these vertices one by one and, and, and draw. Okay. All right, so... Um, that was the main part of our lecture. We have 10 minutes remaining, and that's to justify a formula that's in your current homework, uh, and one that's going to show up in a bunch more. Uh, and that's one more transformation matrix that you need to know. And this is the annoying one that most students in this class politely listen to me talk about and then just look it up. But it is uh, worth thinking about. And that is how to transform the surface normal. I, I saw there was already a question, I believe uh, you asked on, online, um, well, like, where the heck did this inverse transpose formula come from? That's a totally random, uh, totally random, totally reasonable qu question to ask, right? Because somehow it's, it's, not, it's not particularly natural why the inverse transpose of a matrix would pop up. Well, just about anywhere, <laughs> for one, yep. And so that's our, our one remaining task. Okay, so first of all, why do we need surface normals? Well, we've already talked about this, right? The, for shading, the normals are really critical, right? Because the dot product between the surface normal and the vector to the light is the basic shading model. Um, that we'll need here, right? So remember, there's this lamp version shading formula, which is just a dot product scaled by color, which is uh, what's going on in your assignment code so far. In a couple weeks, we'll talk about shading. Actually, you'll have a guest lecturer for your shading uh, lecture, which is one of my graduate students. He'll likely be a little bit nervous because I'll be sitting in the audience. But the awkward thing is, I'll have just had vocal cord, uh, vocal cord, vocal cord surgery, and can't. Give him a hard time if I want to. So both of us will be in a painful scenario. Um, but, but that aside, uh, uh, he'll be the one uh, uh, teaching you shading just for one lecture. And then according to the doctor, we'll be OK. Um, what does that mean? So remember in our tree of transformations, we can keep track of a lot of transformations. And not all of them have to be rotation and translation. They could also be stretching, right? Like maybe I take a square table and I want to make it a rectangular table. Yeah? And in fact, the table is a great example. So let's say that I have a uh, transformation matrix that just scales my geometry horizontally by a factor of two, right? So that would look, you know, something like two in 2D, for example. Yep. Yeah? Okay, so now if I have a square and I put my square into this matrix, obviously what comes out Something two times as wide. So, assuming that this is, you know, in the usual coordinate system, what is the normal to the top surface here? Well, it's pretty easy. It's just zero, one. Now it's going to get your question here. <laughs> yeah? And if I stretch it out, uh, what happens to the normal? Well, nothing. But what would be a problem is if, for example, the normal <laughs> kind of stretched out with the surface. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be so good. 
right? Um, or for example, if I have a circle, what happens if I apply this matrix to my circle? Well, it becomes a wide ellipse. Let's say instead of that two, I put like 2,000. All right, so it's a really, really big ellipse. What's going to happen to the normal at that point? That's exactly the wrong gesture. What is, so where, first of all, where is that point on this object? It's like here-ish. <laughs> so the normal is going to actually approach the vertical direction. Do you see that? The more I stretch it horizontally, the more vertical my normal gets. <laughs> so should I be applying this matrix just directly to the coordinates of the normal? No. No. Exactly. If I applied this matrix, it would actually do that. It would stretch it out with the ellipse. Right? And so this is a long-winded way of saying that the transformation we apply to the normal is not the same as the transformation we apply to the geometry. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's derive what we need to do to the normal. So here's a picture of what that looks like, right? And, and this, this happens a lot, right? I mean, and shearing is another good example of like, this is the incorrect, it kind of looks geometrically okay, but it's incorrect, right? It's not, it's not the normal to the surface. Um, okay, and we need to work this out for all of our, our linear transformations. I have way too many slides in here just to convince you that multiplying by this matrix is the wrong thing to do. Okay, so... Here's how we're going we're gonna to do it, um, which is as follows. So rather than thinking about normal vectors, we're going to think about the tangent plane. Right? So the tangent plane to our surface is a set of all vectors that are perpendicular to the normal vector. Does that make sense? Because it's tangent to the surface. And it's going to work out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to become obvious that transforming the tangent plane is a much easier thing to think about than transforming a surface normal, which is a little bit tricky. Okay, so uh, how are we going to do that? So, uh, let's say I have some uh, surface, and uh, here he is. Here's the normal. And now I'm going to have a new vector v. And he's going to be a tangent vector. Does that make sense? There's a point in the tangent plane. Maybe here's v not the center point here, right? First of all, it actually does make sense to apply our transformation matrix to v. Do you see that? Because uh, this is actually a point, right? So for instance, um, you know, maybe you know, by definition of our, our transformation, V naught, that's the MV naught, right? That's our, our transformation matrix, right? And if this V is just like a small perturbation off of the surface, right, then um, in particular, V naught plus V is mapped to M, right? Because M acts on points, so I can do this kind of a thing, right? Um, okay, so if you subtract these two things, then you can see... Uh, V is mapped to M. So that's okay. Tangent vectors actually do transform with the, 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 the transformation matrix. Okay? Cool. Okay. Yes. Excitement. Okay. All right. So what do we know about the relationship between V and N? They're perpendicular. In particular, algebraically, what can I write? What do we know about perpendicular things? There we go. Okay, v dot n equals zero. Okay. Now let's write a slightly slicker notation for dot products. So we're gonna remember in this class our vectors are <clears throat> our column vectors. Yep. Yeah. So uh, in particular, uh, in fact, we may all write n dot v just for fun. I can write zero equals n transpose times v. Do you see why? Because I take a column vector, I transpose it into a row vector. When I multiply those things together, I get a dot product. And now the question is, V transformed by applying M, what should I do to, to the normal vector? And I know that the normal vector in my transformed object has to be perpendicular to M applied to V. Does that make sense? So I'm going to do a really cute trick. Because I'd like there to be an M next to V, but I can't quite do that because there's 
and n on his left. The exactly. So this is equal to n transpose m inverse m v. Didn't do anything. Now we're going to group this a different way, which is to write this as m inverse transpose times n transpose m v. You guys remember how this works? The transpose of a matrix product is the product of the transpose in the reverse order. Yeah? So take a look at what happened. Here, I have my transform tangent vector. Here, I have m inverse transpose times the normal vector. So these two things are orthogonal. What did we just figure out? We figured out that if we apply m to transform our geometry, then we have to apply m inverse transpose to transform our normal vectors in order to maintain perpendicular perpen orthogonality. Does that make sense? It's just like a little trick. By the way, inverse and transpose commute, so you can, there's this, this typical kind of minus t notation here to, be, to fudge it. Okay, so that's where this inverse transpose formula that already showed up in your homework comes from. And this is a simple thing to uh, apply to, uh, to, to vectors. Let me give you one more additional detail, which I don't think shows up in this homework, but certainly will show up in future ones. So let's say that I'm on the sphere, and uh, where's the eraser? Over here. Um, I have a vector which is very close to the vertical direction. So this is a tiny bit off, right? So this vector, you know, the x-coordinate is maybe, you know, minus epsilon, the y-coordinate is like 1 minus some tiny amount, right? What's going to happen when I... So we talk about inverse transpose. Somehow it doesn't look like this did the right thing, right? Because I'd like this thing to become more vertical, but the only interesting stuff is happening in this matrix is in the x-coordinate. What went wrong? So first of all, what is the inverse of this matrix? This is 1 over 2,000, 1, 1, yeah? The transpose doesn't, doesn't do anything because this is diagonal. So, what am I going to end up doing? I'm going to end up basically scaling, you know, dividing by a big number instead of multiplying by it, right? And what that's going to do is it's going to kind of get rid of the other coordinate. And then, unfortunately, my vector is no longer going to have unit norm, right? So what am I going to have to do? Renormalize. Yeah, so that's a gotcha with this formula, is that the, the normal does uh, transform by the inverse transpose, but it may no longer be unit length. So if you want the unit normal, then you've got to divide this thing by its length. Okay. Cool, and that, uh, that concludes our discussion for today. So are there any questions about uh, this transformation or hierarchical uh, scene descriptions, all that good stuff? I hate this stuff. It's really hairy and boring. Starting next time, we'll be back on... Uh, more interesting growth. Actually, no, that's not true. We get one more of these hierarchical lectures, and then we do physics, and that's much more fun. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, I will see you on Tuesday. Don't forget your assignment is due tomorrow, and you've got another one that's already out, so get started. And uh, we'll see you next week. And there's a nano quiz.